Hello, my name is Alex Gote, and I'm a full-time youth minister here in the great state of Texas, more specifically Houston. I have been married 17 years to my soulmate, to somebody I absolutely love and I thank God for constantly. And I have three amazing boys. In saying that, I'm a convert, so I like to use scripture. I like to definitely talk with my hands and so forth. So um, I hope that you appreciate that in the message that you're about to hear and so forth. So uh, before we start, let's go ahead and pray and um, dive into this. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you just for another opportunity just to share um, in, well, one, to sit in, into your word, but also to share what it is that you put on my heart about being brave in our, the world that we live in. Lord, you're amazing. You're so perfect. Um, to show yourself to each one of us. Let me get out of the way so that your word, your light, your love, your mercy is always shown. And um, Lord, you speak. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, I'm a convert. And saying that I'm a convert, um, I have a lot of youth ministry experience, young adult ministry experience, and adult ministry for that experience, um, on the Protestant side. And um, whenever I became Catholic, I kind of took that Paul approach, if you will, that once I come to faith, I need to shut up, sit down, and just kind of watch, observe, and just like, yo, just like kind of take in, if you will. So in saying that, I went to, you know, all around and like visited different places and so forth. And one of the common things that I would always hear from people who um, literally, you know, had like a lot of good things going on and so forth, you would commonly hear like, yo, like things, bad things, that's not really going on with young adults and teens in the world that we live in, in the world that we minister in. So I kind of stepped back. I remember that time and I kind of stepped back and I was just like, well, yo, that, you know, maybe not, God is not calling me to, to do ministry on this side. So I just, you know, started studying theology and so forth. Fast forward, been in youth ministry on the Catholic side, not just the Protestant side for a number of years. And I would say it's quite the opposite, truth be told. I would say quite the opposite. I would say that um, the more I'm in this, the more I see the brokenness and, and just, um, the healing that needs to take place and so forth, and the ability for people to take off their masks. The other day I was in a, in a meeting and so forth. There was probably about like 60 or so teens and I was about to give a message and I was about to, you know, um, go in and so forth. And um, I start speaking and it was just like right around the front, like right around the beginning of the of the talk. And as I'm talking, I start to notice different phones start ringing and, and people looking down. And usually that doesn't happen. I want to make sure that I say that. Usually people kind of stay attentive and so forth. And I like to, you know, walk around so I, you know, keep their attention. So I'm, I'm doing this and I notice like different parts of the room. People are like looking at their phones, looking at different areas and so forth. And they're, and like, um, they're like, oh, and you can see their faces. So I'm giving the talk and I'm still like looking at their faces. I'm like, yo, there must be something going on. So in saying that, I had my phone like on the, uh, uh, the, the podium and I was, you know, giving the talk and so forth. And I noticed at the corner of my eye, my phone went off. And the person that was usually here, usually always there serving and so forth, they're calling me. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And then I should have said this. I noticed a lot of them, they were leaving. A lot of them were leaving. And I was like, what is going on in my head? Because this is by far not normal. So I kind of already figured something was happening. So the moment that this person calls me, I'm like, yo, maybe I need to take this. So I'm like, yo, let's let's chill for a second. And um, I, I want to answer this phone. So I answer the phone. I, I, I walk out and I answer the phone. And automatically, I can hear this young lady crying. She's like screaming. And I'm like, yo, what in the world is going on, you know? And um, and I could see some of the other people who left, they're on their phones and they're like starting to cry and so forth. And I'm like, holy snap, like, yo, like what in the world is going on? The lady, the now she's a young lady, um, she was a teen back then, but the lady is just like, yo, Alex, um, my neighbor just walked outside carrying a kid and the kid was shot. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? 
And I'm like, are you okay? And she's like crying hysterically and just like, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, yo, call the police, so forth. And she's like, yeah, police are all around, but there's a lady outside. She's my neighbor. My neighbor's standing outside with her, somebody that she knew. Apparently she used to babysit this um, this kid. And she's like, hey, they're, you know, basically the, the kid ended up dead. So I'm like, okay. You know, and the kid, you know, passed away. I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay, so yo, like, like everybody, you know, let's go back inside. Let's continue and so forth. So I kind of continue. As I continue, uh, um, I start getting, there's another person, uh, one of the staff members is start, starting to tell me. And like, as I'm talking and so forth, like, you know, keeping the, the teens attentive. And again, we had like, again, like, it was, a, it was quite a bit in the room. So I'm sitting there talking to them, but they're telling me what's going on outside. They're like, hey, keep the teens here. Keep the teens here. They keep telling me, keep the teens in this room. And I'm like, why in the world should I keep the teens in this room? We're good, you know? Um, this is what it is that I found out after the event. You see, that late young lady, that young lady's neighbor, what ended up happening was the uncle ended up coming in and basically tying up that family and shooting them. I want to say it was the uncle. The uncle was on the run because there was police there and so forth. And apparently that uncle had came right to our church, right to our parish, like right outside. And there was helicopters circling all around. So I'm sitting there talking to these teens, trying to keep them attentive. The young lady's name is Cassidy Stay, and I don't know if you know about this. This happened about two years ago or so. And I don't know if you know the situation, but just like I explained, she was on the news afterwards. She was the only survivor in her family. And I remember they were, they were talking about on the news, they were giving like the memorial and so forth. And she's sitting there talking and I cannot help but remember the amount of courage that this young lady had. She, I want to say she was shot too. In fact, I know that she was, she was shot too. But um, every one of these families, she lost her family. And what is kind of crazy was like, how many teens that I knew that like knew her that like went to school with her and so forth. They went, she went to school, like they all were like friends and so forth. And so we ended up having like a little, um, the next week, a little service for, for her and her family and so forth. But um, that courage spoke to me. That courage, I feel, is like something that we could kind of, we should definitely tap into, especially in the society that we live in today. I don't know if you live in America and I don't know if you know what's going on here, but um, the opposite of courage, I would say, is fear. And that's definitely what's going on with the different um, aspects of the police and the different minorities and everything that's going on. It's fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown pushes us. And what we need is courage to move beyond that. Because fear, like, it, it yells at each one of us in one special way. So for me, what it is that I feel is that courage and Obviously, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit, but courage is something that we need to kind of move past this. So I want to give you the definition of courage. Courage is a quality of mind. This is what Webster says, the smart guy Webster. He would say that courage is a quality of mind or spirit that enables the person to face such situation without fear. Yo, I want to make sure that I say this. I don't think that that's right. Because I was in the Marine Corps and I understand. Like I knew people in special forces, some of my friends, so forth. And let me tell you something. You know what fear is, but see, here's the thing. You don't listen to that fear. Like you move past that fear. Fear actually is a part that like, like yells at you and you move past. You see what I'm saying? And it pushes you, if you will. And I honestly feel that if we got a hold of that, not only in our day-to-day -day lives, but in our ministries and so forth, that we would understand what's going on. Fear allows us to look to like for young ladies. Fear allows us to walk inside of an area, right? Um, courage allows us to walk inside of an area and you might hear, if you're a young lady, that this person is beautiful. This person is more beautiful than you. Whenever you have courage, you're like, yo, I'm beautiful too. And this young lady's beautiful too. And y'all may look absolutely different. By the way, I definitely have to say this since, you know, just what I'm here for. Yo, some of the stuff that we see on the social media, on TV and so forth, those are just images photoshopped and all kinds of stuff. Real talk, ladies. Some of you are starving yourselves, honestly, for something that's really not real. And what you need is courage. Young men, be honest with you, dog. Like, for real. Um, courage is definitely something that you need to be a man. And man is not taking advantage of females. I'm going to make sure that I say that. Real men. Real, I like how this one meme said it. Real men lead women to the cross, not to the bedroom. And you know that. 
you know that fear yells at you and courage is the one thing that kind of moves past that. And that's what it is that we need is courage, this thing. So let me ask you a question. How courageous would you be if you knew the end of the story? Like, think about that for a second. Because the reality is that we know the end of the story as Christians. If you say that you believe, if you really say that you believe, how courageous is your life being? And here's the funny thing is, a lot of times like we go to mass, we go, you know, you may be hearing a story or something along those lines, a Bible story. And you're like, yo, like you hear that story knowing the end. And you don't understand that the people there in the story, they don't know the end. They don't know that um, certain things are about to transpire other than Jesus. He was the only one that absolutely knew. But everybody else didn't. Well, you can say Mary, but too. But everybody else in those stories doesn't really know. How's it going to end? Let's take one for example, Noah. So we know all this, you know, all the animals that came two by two and so forth. How many days did Noah stay inside the ark? 40 days, right? Let me ask you a question though. How did everybody on that boat know that it was 40 days? No. In fact, could you imagine? I mean, just think about it. We think about it. It's like, like day 39. We're like, yo, good job, guys. Good job. We only got one more day to go. Good job. Good job. Good job. No. No, let me put you into the story. Could you imagine how it felt to look over the edge and see everything that you walked on underwater, all those people pass away, all the places you may have worshiped underwater? Could you imagine how many people were running up to them and like literally they saw them pass away? Could you imagine what they did to them psychologically? Could you imagine how literally it must have felt because they didn't know the end? how it felt for each one of them. Some of us need to know that it's gonna stop raining. You see, because that's what was going on with Noah. And whenever you insert yourself into the story, we need, we can become a little bit more of that story. So let me ask you, let me make sure that I say this to you guys. Some of us need to hear that, hey, yo, it's gonna stop raining one day. It's definitely going to, because life presents itself in a certain way. I want to introduce you to somebody whom I absolutely love and whom, man, I think um, more people need to hear about. It's a guy named Carol Votiwa. So check it out. Carol Votiwa was born in his time, like a day in like the 1900s and so forth. And so he um, was born kind of to a poor family. What ends up happening is his mother, his mother, by the time even he re receives first communion, she passes away. She gets sick and passes away. The only way that he has to deal with it, to be honest with you, is his brother. So they play and so forth. He has an older brother. They play, they play soccer. There's stories of them playing soccer and so forth. And one day he comes home, his brother gets sick and dies. So all he has is literally his father. That's it. No more. So around, you know, he, he grows up, he starts going to college around that time. The communists come in. I want to say the Nazis at that time. And they start basically killing all the professors. And everybody who's going to college, basically they make them work or they're going to kill you. So he goes to work at a rock quarry. I want you to picture this. It's raining, snowing. There's stories of him literally only walking there with just his shoes on with no socks in the cold and maybe sometimes a coat, sometimes not a coat, going back and forth. And all he has is his father. He would wake up in the middle of the night and see his father praying. And in fact, the way that he say it is his father was his first seminary. Something beautiful and parents need to think about if you're watching this. So one day he comes home and his father doesn't wake up. His father dies and he literally has nobody left. His way of rebelling against the Nazis was doing plays and so forth. And if you know anything about Carol Voti, well, you know who it is that he ends up becoming. John Paul II, or should I say St. John Paul II, who gave us things like theology of the body and so forth, using atheist theology, atheist philosophy, a dude who definitely knew what it meant to be having courage, what it meant to have a night of, I mean, a constant like reigning in his life, but it didn't overshadow him. And there's a saying that I love in certain right here, after the darkest night comes the lightest day. And he definitely lived by that, he had courage. Another story that, that if we knew, like if we actually paid attention to what was going on, was no, I mean, was um, Jonah and the whale. Check it out. 
Like, here's the thing about Jonah and the whale. What happened was Jonah was called to go to the Ninevites and he doesn't want to. So he gets on a boat. All right. He gets on a boat and like basically it's like raining and all this different things. And to avoid him going to go preach. OK, and him for in order for him to avoid it, what he ends up doing is he jumps off the boat. OK, but I got to imagine the story and he gets eaten by a whale and stays there for three days. My dude stays there for three days inside the belly of the whale. Now, again, we know the end of the story. We act like, oh, he's in there chilling, so forth. Like he has an iPhone, like popping it open and just sitting there and so forth. No. Could you basically he ends up jumping off to commit suicide and he ends up getting eaten. And like, could you imagine he's like, holy snap, I'm still alive in here. Could you imagine him trying to swim? How dark it was in there and how it must have smelled. And how alone he felt, just literally just praying out to God. And if you get a chance, I want you to read the story and especially the prayer of Jonah. Because he doesn't know that he's getting out. And he knows that like, man, this is all that I have right here. And he prays out to God from his heart. Some of us need to know that this darkness is going to end. There's going to be light. Some of us need to know that there's so much more than what's going on in the world around us. Six years ago, I go to get my tonsils removed. As I get my tonsils removed, um, I have to go back for a pre-op. I have to go back for, you know, um, basically what ends up happening is after a week, you come back and you get to, you know, kind of hear, you know, your status and so forth, check on you and so forth. And I remember I get my tonsils removed and um, the doctor calls me. He's like, hey, I want to make sure that you're coming. Now, the doctor never calls, first of all. So I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely coming and so forth. They're like, hey, can you get here early? And I'm like, all right, I'll come in early. Not a big deal. So I come in about 30, 45 minutes early. And now I don't know if you know how doctors are in America. You usually have to go and you have to wait like three days. You know, you can take like a meal. You can do all these different things because you're going to be there for a minute. I get there early. And by the way, I was taking a class. Um, I was finishing my master's in theology and I had like a class in Christology I was taking at that time. And so as I get there, the lady, I get there early, about 45 minutes early, the lady comes out and she's like, hey, why don't you come back in to the back? And I'm like, okay, did I not pay a bill or something? Like what in the world is going on here? So I decide to go back. The doctor says, why don't you sit down? I got a story to, I got something to tell you. And I'm like, yo, what's going on, man? And he's looking at me. And I remember looking at his face and he tells me, we found cancer. And not only do we find cancer, we don't know what's going to end up happening. I ended up having to go through radiation and all these things. And I remember that was probably one of the darkest times of my life. I don't have cancer anymore and I'm free of cancer, but I remember the prayers and so forth of those. And it was a definitely dark time, but in that dark time, there were times of prayer. There were times of God just basically ministering to me in a special way. And I wanna say that's one of the reasons why I'm doing what it is that I'm doing here. Because during that time, it was revealed to me. I could clearly hear God um, saying that there was so much more that, um, he wanted me to do. Now, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know it was all this, but it definitely was um, to get back into ministry and, and, and move. So some of us need to know that, man, there is going to be light after that darkness. And had I not known, I'm going to be honest with you. I remember going to the Blessed Sacrament with my wife and um, right after we got the news. And, um, and I remember just saying, whatever happens, Lord, I accept it. Some of us need to know that that's okay right there, right where you're at. Just to have that courage to face what it is that's going on. And Lord, you're enough for me. Years ago, I heard this story about these missionaries. I'm going to close with this story. There's these missionaries. um, They meet in college and so forth. And they decide to go to this, um, I want to say it was Brazil. And in Brazil, they had cannibals and so forth that they were ministering to. And they went with a team. Some of the team that they went with, they ended up losing to the cannibals and so forth. 
So they saw a lot of conversions and they had a rough time there, losing friends. They were deciding, should they come back? Should they? And they just stayed and kept ministering. So in the end, um, basically, they ended up getting a lot of people converted and so forth and knowing the Christian faith. So they decide, okay, we're done. Decide to come back. When they came back, it was the time when you know, people were catching ships and so forth. And I want to say Theodore Roosevelt was on that boat that they ended up catching the president at that time. So um, they're arriving in New York. They're arriving in New York. And what ends up happening is as they're going in, um, all these people are making all this noise because the president is there and so forth. And it's like a big old party. And, um, you know, they get off the boat, they get in the cab, and the young man looks at his, um, at his missionary friend and, uh, and is like, yo, I can't help but feel pain right now. I can't help but feel a lot of jealousy right now. And his missionary friend was like, yo, you know what? Me too. So they both were like, yo, you know what? Let's go to church and pray about this. So they go to church. And, you know, they're praying. They're like, Lord, you know, we gave everything. And this is just the president. Everybody's all happy about him coming back and so forth. And look at us. Like, we gave our lives and we're coming back to nothing. What are we coming back to? When they get done praying, one of the guys looks at the other missionary and it says, amen. I feel God spoke to me. He's like, yo, what do you think he said? He said, we're not home yet. We're not home yet. A lot of us need to know that... um. This isn't the end, that you're not home yet. That once you live with that courage, knowing that, knowing the end of the story, truth is, is that, yo, whatever that's going on, it's dope just to know that God is with you, holding you, beckoning you, calling you to become a saint. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>